throughout all of scripture there is one verse that works its way into my spirit frequently with an intentional insistence for tension forces its way into prayer sessions and makes unannounced appearances in my sermons it creeps into conversations and it challenges my faith to look past what I see into the unseen. It irritates and invigorates. It challenges and it chides. It gets in my head. It gets under my skin. Anyone know where I'm going with this a little bit? And anybody know that, that revival is just that thing that we desire but we haven't attained it yet and, and we've got little glimmers glimmers of it and we've glimpses of it and we've got just little touches of it but how many know that there is an apostolic end time revival that is coming that we are desiring there is there is promise in the word of god that yields a vision of what we understand the end time church will look like when she is in revival there's a major prophecy from a minor prophet. It's a yet to be seen revival. It's emphatic. It's a declaration, but yet it's a yearning. It's limited to the end time, yet it's unlimited in its scope. It's multicultural. It's multi-generational. It's not gender biased. It has no socioeconomic preference. It's just an end time revival prophecy that we find in Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. And it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Would someone say all? all? That all flesh, no matter where they live, no matter what their demographic is, no matter what border surrounds them right now, no matter what government rules them right now, no matter where they live, no matter if they're first, second, third world country, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter any of that. The Bible just says that God was going to pour his spirit out on all flesh. And somewhere in God's providence and God's vision, he saw us as people that he could trust with this apostolic outpouring. Just take a look around tonight for a moment. These people that are amongst us tonight, these wonderful people that you see, God has privileged you with truth. God has privileged you with the power of his spirit. God has enabled us and God has filled us. God has quickened us and God has challenged us. God has spoke to us by the gifts of the spirit. He has placed the fruit of the spirit in our lives, I hope. And, and we've preached about that and we've talked about it. But somewhere in the scope of the end time prophecy, God said, you know, these people at this place in this time, I'm going to enable them and I'm going to gift them with something that the world is going to see eventually that they're going to need absolutely but I'm going to gift it to them we have that spirit we are a people of the spirit we have been filled with his spirit we walk in the spirit we are called by his presence we we know about the spirit of God there's a powerful thing there but that spirit is going to be poured out one day upon all flesh all flesh all flesh your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, will I pour out my spirit? He will. God said he's going to pour his spirit out. It's going to be multicultural. It's going to be multi-generational. Before, come on, before it was a catchphrase or before it was a buzzword, be before it was something on social media that we all needed to pay attention to, be before somebody kind of started getting credit for pushing the envelope, God talked about a multicultural church. We don't, I'm getting ahead of myself, but we won't. God talked about it before anybody was talking about it. And we need to talk about it too. And also upon servants in the, and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. But, but it's this word, this word that Joel begins with. He said, it shall come to pass afterward. I think that's the, the part that, that is challenging for us. Because if we only knew the when. After what? Afterward. And, and we're, we're given some intelligence in the scripture. We, we, get, we get to know that after what? There's, there's some indicators for us to pencil in on our end time calendar. There's, there's four things if you want to notice them together with me if you're taking notes. And in and, and verse 23 of that chapter, you'll find that he speaks about a season of outpouring. 
So there is something that's going to come after even the outpouring that will come. He said, when there is an outpouring of the former and the latter rain together in the first month. In other words, he said that what uh, should have been uh, the combination of impact over a number of months happens together in a single month of outpouring that, that you can kind of perk your ears up and get your eyes on the horizon for what might be coming because it's in a season like that, in a season of outpouring that after that there's going to be a worldwide harvest. There's, there's going to be a unparalleled revival that we're going to see. It's, it's going to happen. So when we see that season of outpouring, someone say outpouring. That, that's why we're grateful every time that we hear about somebody receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Doesn't matter to me where it happens. Doesn't matter about which church it happens in. I just, I just celebrate God pouring his spirit out. I'm, I'm grateful when it happens at CCC. I, I'm grateful for when it happens at the church across town. I'm grateful when it happens in the church in a neighboring province. I, I'm grateful when it happens at our district camp meeting. And I'm grateful when it happens at Miller Lake. And I see those reports and, and there's something inside me that serves. Why? Because Here's what I know in a season and after a season of outpouring, there's going to be a great and a worldwide harvest of revival. God is going to do that. So every time that we see God pouring his spirit out here and God pouring his spirit out there, we can begin to celebrate because it's an indicator of an apostolic end time revival that we all are looking for. I'm saying, God, is this the time that afterward, is this the season when afterward, after this, it's going to happen? I, I got something stirring in my spirit about this, just the, the, the camp meetings that I'm hearing about and how God is moving. I'm encouraged because it's in moments like that when it begins to stir and, and something begins to happen in the supernatural that there's going to be an end time harvest. Number two, the, the next thing that God gives us an indicator of is, is in Joel chapter 2 and verse 24. He said that the floors, there's, you know, it's a, it's a logical progression that if that former and the latter rain come together in the first month, that the floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. It's going to be a season of harvest that <clears throat> I, I sometimes I... I Sometimes I chafe under the responsibility that this complex gives us. That, I mean, the con, not, not my own personal complex. <laughs> campus. Pa Pastor Matt often uses that word. It's a great word. The campus here at CCC because, because sometimes it could get a little bit wearisome. With all, we, We're so grateful for this new sanctuary. And I haven't got over, yeah, I'm not over that yet. Just the excitement of, of being in this room and... And everything being new and, and no pink pews and no burgundy carpet or whatever that color was. Not still celebrating that. But sometimes it's a bit of work. All, all of, I think I told somebody once, I said, I think we have a football field under a roof. By the time you add that floor, that floor, this floor, those floors, that floor, that attic. <laughs> and, and I can tell you that we've crawled through every square inch of them. I've been in, we've been, sorry, we've been. We've been in the steeple, we've been in the steeple, we've been outside down to the footing course. We've literally been from the top to the bottom, from the front to the back. We've, it, it can get wearisome sometimes, just this complex maintenance and challenging and inviting everybody to come for work days and, and, uh, and yeah, all that. I'm getting tired of talking about it. And now's a great time that if that, the Holy Ghost just prompted you to volunteer, you're, wel you're welcome. I mean, you're welcome to volunteer and you're welcome because I'm assuming you're saying thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> but sometimes that, that responsibility can, can seem a little, over, but here's what I do know. I don't think it's by accident that we're here with this. Because revival says we need a place. And I thank God we got a place because revival says the seats that are empty right now won't be. Revival says that the balcony that's in the dark right now 
won't be. When, when, when revival comes, we're going we're gonna to see some great things happen. That, that, that revival, that, and sometimes we, we get looking at the natural and say, well, it's a lot to take care of. We've got, and then let's move past the building. Let's go to 40 acres, and we've got different people that have called. We have two different requests today about inquiries about the property. And sometimes we just say, we're, we're, we're just going to press pause on, 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 on some of those ideas because, because we don't know yet what God has in store for CCC. And, and our belief and our desire is that it's, it's not about our name, but I'll tell you what it is about. It's about a city that needs God. And we've got a place that we can bring the city to God in. And, and, and we've got a great location. And we've got, we've got a beautiful campus. And thank God for all that. But we don't believe it's just, you know, happenstance. We don't believe it was just some accidental good move on, on Pastor Woodward's part to buy property. That, that's not what it's about. It's because God has a great plan in store. And, and we're just walking in the Holy Ghost and we're being led by the Spirit and we're believing that one day, very soon, these seats won't hold all the people that we need. And on a midweek service, we're going to need this entire room to house the people that are coming because God has an end time revival in store. Every tribe, every nation, every kindred, every tongue going to come. So a season of harvest that the floors shall be full. Someone say full, full. of wheat and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I, I, I love those times when... And are you, sir, youth uh, explosion or youth convention where we, we can't put everybody in the seats? We got to kind of open the doors and get some seats lined up out there. And, and we got some people, you know, crammed in the balcony. We're lining, lining back up people in the green. I, I'm, grateful, I'm grateful for that, but I'm looking for that time when it overflows. We got to let that build in our spirit because we, we can preach about it for so long and I want to talk just a little bit about that tonight, but, but we can talk about it for so long that we can get accustomed to hearing about what might happen in the future, that we forget it. it's going to happen in our present. So Pastor Matt kind of stirred us up on Sunday night and, and just to carry through with that that lesson about revival, the season of outpouring, a season of harvest afterward, there's, there's even a greater revival that's coming. And, and then verse 25, it says there's a season of restoration. And uh, even <clears throat> in our staff meeting, we've been talking about opportunities and just reaching out to our community. But even, even people that have been here in the past five years or people that are a part of the history, but maybe they're present, things just got sideways or they just got off track that I, I believe that God is going to do a work of restoration. Someone say restoration. And Joel 2 25 says, God said, I will restore to you. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. Every, every destructive force in the field was, was those elements, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, and the locusts. They had varying degrees of intensity on the crop, how they would just destroy a crop. But God said he was going to restore. And sometimes when we didn't see what happened, and, and we're thinking that the locust has had the control, and the canker worm now is the winner, and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, well, they're the triumphant ones. God said, hang on a minute, you're forgetting that I am the God of restoration. And so what you may have lost, you can't hold it in your hand, but I'm the one that's able to restore. I'm the one that's able to bring back the backslider. I'm the one that's able to restore what's been lost, that family member that you still pray about. Why? Because you're believing that word that God said, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. I, I just came with hope tonight to remind us that God's going to do a work of restoration. God's going to restore the years that the locust has eaten. In other words, what may have been lost, not just because of that initial product or produce that was lost to that, those, those worms and, and the caterpillar and the, the palmer worm, the locust, not, not just that initial produce, but the product of that produce that would have come from the seed, the multiplied factor of the seed. It, 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 God's going to restore it. You can't do it in the natural, but when you step over into the supernatural, God said, I'm going to restore everything that was lost, but you're not going to get one back for one that was lost. You're going to have a multiplied restoration for the one because that one would have 
have produced seed that would have come on for the years. That's why he said the year, not just the year, but the years. He said, I'm going to restore it. So everything that would have grown as a result of what was lost, everything that could have grown, God said, I'm going to restore to you the years that that was eaten. I, I just came to celebrate tonight for a few moments because he's a, he's a God of restoration. He's a God of restoration and a season of, uns, a, a season of certainty. In place of our uncertainty, God is going to place a certainty in our spirit. And, and I'm beginning to sense that rise up. And you shall know, verse 27, that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God. And none else and my people shall never be ashamed. That there's a confidence that coming. And if it was just those things that we gained and we gleaned, we could celebrate. If it was just a season of outpouring, we'd celebrate about outpouring. If it was just a season of harvest, and if it was just a season of restoration and a season of certainty, then we would celebrate all that. But, but that was what Joel went on to say. And afterward, after all of that great thing, those great things have happened, after all those great promises have been yielded, after that, you're going to see revival. See, I've always, often I've read that, and I've always just assumed that that was the revival, but then he said, and afterward, after that, he said, then I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. I'm going to do that work of restoration. I'm going to do that work of faith. I'm going to do that, that work of outpouring in the season of harvest and restoration. But afterward, after all that has happened, there is more in store. I love it when God just kind of blows our mind and blows our idea because for some of us, the, the greatest revival would just be that revival of restoration or the greatest revival would just be floors full of wheat and vats that would overflow or the greatest harvest would be a season of outpouring. Wow. <laughs> but that's just God getting, getting going. That's just God beginning. That's just God said, now, now when you see this happen, get ready. Because after that, afterward, the revival is coming. <laughs> it just is, it's an indicator that, that we, we are so limited in our scope, our ability to see what God sees for our future. We are so limited with, with history and we're so limited with pain of the past. and We're so limited, but God doesn't want us to live in that limitation. He said, when we see all this happening, he said, afterward. And so here we are. Where are we? We're, we're waiting in this moment. We're waiting in that here and now. We're, we're waiting until the great until. Until revival comes. And until restoration happens. And until harvest occurs. Until confidence comes into God's people. Until all that we are, we are waiting. We're just waiting. and We don't like waiting. But there are some things in life that are just worth waiting for. It was that New Testament church, and I'm not, I know I just preached a message on Terry until Pentecost, but it was that New Testament church in Acts 2 that waited until. Genesis, or sorry, Luke 24, verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. It's important that we identify what we're waiting for. What we're waiting for because we can get lost. We can get lost in the waiting room that God has us placed in. We, we can get off track in the waiting room and, and we can end up feeling like, well, this is where, this waiting room is just where we're going to hang up our hat. I guess this, this is where it all comes down. And, and we end up living so limited because we're in the waiting room, but we forgot that we're waiting for something to come. We get so accustomed. We, anybody, anybody know? Can you tell me right now what your dentist's office waiting room looks like? I can. Or not yours. I can tell you what mine looks like. Thanks, Steve. We, we, I, can tell you, I can tell you how the chairs are laid out. I can tell you probably within, within a few inches of, of the, the perimeter, the foot perimeter, because I'll tell you why. I don't like waiting. And while I'm sitting there waiting, I'm thinking, hmm, is a toothbrush on the wall? There's, there's, uh, there's chairs around the perimeter, and 
I can't think of the color right now. That probably says something about me that somebody smart could figure out. Don't know. <clears throat> but but I, I, I know what it looks like I, because I just, sometimes when, because when I have an appointment, I show up on the time of the appointment, I don't like to wait. So sometimes I'm trying to distract myself because I had an appointment. Apparently, someone didn't brush their teeth. Now, one cavity has turned into ten. And they're going to do them all while it's... Ah, 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 ah. So while they're in there, ah, 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 I'm out there going... Because ah, ah. we, don't, we, don't like, we don't like the waiting room, but if we're not... You know why we're frustrated with the waiting room? Because we know we're not supposed to be there very long. We know that it's just a, a quick seat, but sometimes what happens is while we're waiting, while we're waiting for God's promise, we end up feeling like this is where we're supposed to stay. We get comfortable. We bring our pillows into the waiting room. We get, we get our blankets all out. We just kind of set up shop. We just, this is home, I guess. I guess this is where we're supposed to live. We haven't received the promise yet. So can we just remind ourselves that there is a promise of revival coming? We're, we may be in the waiting room, but it's temporary. It's, got, it's just until God's ready to call us into that next place of revival. So, so don't get disturbed and don't get dismayed and, and don't think that this is the end all be all. This is the beginning. We're going to need everybody on deck. We're, we're going to need everybody training and prepping and planning for what God's going to do. If we're really ready for revival, if we're just waiting, then you know what? Let's take advantage of the season while we're waiting. Let's do some learning because somebody's going to learn something from you. You're going to teach them doctrine. You're going to teach them truth. You're going to teach them about the love of Jesus. You're, you're going to, we're going to need help in the nursery. And we're going to need help in the Sunday school. So while I'm waiting, I might as well take advantage of the time and, and get ready to teach and get ready to preach and get ready to reach. While I'm waiting, it's important that we identify what we're waiting for. But it's also equally important that, that we identify that we're just waiting. Because if we're not careful, we'll turn into wandering. That's what happened with Israel. She waited so long that her promise was right there and she wouldn't step into it. She, she got content waiting in the waiting room. The, the spies went in. They came back with grand reports about the land. They came back uh, with the hope of what was there. Two of them did anyway. But 10 came back and said, oh, there's some giants. And everyone said, you know what? Oh, I'm, I'm, good. I'm good with the waiting room. I'll just hang out here. And, and then the waiting room turns into aimless wandering. You can... Go ahead and look it up. 40 years of wandering because they didn't realize that the wilderness was just supposed to be a quick wait before the promise was received. That's all it was supposed to be. It was supposed to just be a, a quick pause. It was supposed to just be, just be a, let's just wait here for a few minutes. We're going to go in and check things out, and then we're going into the land of promise. Church, I don't want us to miss the revival that God has in this end time because we just kind of begin to wander. And the wilderness wandering go on in our spirit and we get wilderness wandering mentality and we get wilderness wandering and, and, and yeah, God can prove himself in the wilderness, but God wanted to prove himself in the promised land to Israel. I'm, I'm just reminding us tonight that revival is waiting for us. So, so don't, get, don't get too attached to the waiting room. Don't, don't get too attached to that brand new seat that you're sitting in. Don't get too attached to the location that you sit in because before long, if we really get into that promise that God has for us of revival, guess what's going to happen? We're going to be, <laughs> someone may show up earlier than us for our seat. I mean, I'm glad. I, I like that y'all sit in the same seat right now. I, I kind of have an idea about who's here and who's not. I like, I like, I'm grateful for that, but, but, <clears throat> but get ready because God is going to shuffle some things. Telling us everything we already know, but <clears throat> you know the waiting room. We know the waiting room. It still alarms me that Israel could come right to the border of the promise. That they could send spies and hear reports and then choose not to move in because they would rather wait. So yes, we're waiting, but we're not wandering. We're waiting with intention. There's a difference. There's, we're, we're waiting until the doors open up. I, I remember when Target came to Fredericton. Target department store. It was like a little bit of USA in Canada. 
And we were so excited as a family, okay? Some of us were so excited. <laughs> and, and Kathy said, I would like to be the first customer through the doors at the new Target. And so we went up and we got in line. I don't know what time, how early we got there. I don't know. But we were first in line. And when those new doors, I know some of you are already in mourning because Target never lasted. But when those new doors opened onto that shiny floor, we didn't stand back in line and go, well, <clears throat> someone tell me what it's like in there. You have an idea about what I like. Could you, would you go in and then come back and just tell me about what? No, we didn't. We paraded through and then told everybody. We were first through the doors of the new Target that now is closed. <laughs> that couldn't make a go of it in Canada. But we didn't wait. when We knew what we were there for. We were there waiting for the doors to open. We were there waiting for everything that we had heard about to be released. We were there waiting for the opportunity to enter in. Can I just remind us that's why we're here? We're here, but we're waiting for that revival and it's gonna take res some responsibility on our part. We're, it's gonna take some time on our part. We're gonna, it's gonna take some effort on our part. But we know why we're here. That, that, that's why we, we, we've got prayer service and that's why um, I, I was thinking today, we haven't talked a, a lot lately about our fasting and praying. I hope that some of you are still fasting and praying and I need to do more fasting and praying. I got on the scales in the last couple days, yeah. You all know it anyway, I might as well say it. But we need, we need, we need that. Why? Because we're planning for the revival. We're waiting. This is not a touch-free revival. It's it comes with a cost. It, it requires something of us. I, I love the gizmos and gadgets. Today's Amazon Prime Day 2022. Anybody buy anything on Amazon today? I did. Just me. $6 part that I was needing, 20% off. I, I, I hate to disappoint, but there's no... Alexa, bring revival. Or Google, turn on Holy Ghost fire. This is not a touch-free revival. It's, it's a revival. We're waiting for it, but it, it takes requirement and effort on our part. We need to understand the season that we're in. It's the season for end-time revival. So while we're waiting for end-time revival... We have to prepare for end time revival. If we refuse to identify it, we'll just be wandering in the wilderness instead of waiting. But if we identify, this is what revival feels like. This is when we know that revival fires are burning. This is what we see when, 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 when after, we're waiting for the afterward. So we're waiting for restoration and we're waiting for outpouring and we're waiting for Certainty, and we're waiting for all those things to happen because we know that afterward. But it's that waiting game that we hate the worst. If we, if we don't identify what we're waiting for, we'll feel and begin to believe that this is just the end all be all. That this is what we're going to become and this is what we're doing. But God said, would you, would you anticipate something greater? And I'm just... Sunday night, Pastor Matt stirred up anticipation in my spirit. Isaiah 40, verse 31. So we're waiting, not wandering. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run, not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Waiting, but, but in the waiting, it's not just that passive sitting and waiting like it's active, it's engaged. They that wait up on the Lord, they, they are, they're mounting up on wings like eagles. They're running, they're not weary. They're walking, they're not fainting. They're, they're engaged. God, God is waiting for a church that even though we're waiting, we're fully engaged in seeing the promise. If you backed up a few verses, it said he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. 
Why? Because sometimes our strength is depleted, but God said, let me increase your strength. And, and sometimes we get faint in the journey, but God said, let me bring power into the equation. Let's, let's get rid. While you're waiting, while you're waiting, you don't have to be faint. You don't have to be powerless. God says, let, let me just do this work of rest- restoration. Let me, let me strengthen you. Don't be weary. So church, I came, I came not to, to beat us down tonight. I came to encourage us that in the midst of our waiting, don't be weary. Seek God for that strength that he promised wouldn't could be ours. Allow God to, to do the work that, that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Mount up with wings as eagles. Run, not be weary, that they would walk and not faint. That promise is ours while we're waiting. And so, yes, we haven't seen that end time apostolic revival yet. But here's what I know. I'm waiting for it. And while I'm waiting, I don't have to be depleted. I can be strengthened. I can be encouraged. I can be empowered. I can rise up. I don't have to just kind of sit here on the chair waiting. I get to be engaged in what God is bringing while I'm waiting. While I'm waiting. Waiting on God is engaging, active, people participating is yearning and desiring it's hungering waiting is praying the end time church will wait in prayer closets on their knees in basements upstairs wherever your prayer closet may be wherever that place where you connect with God is then then God says in that place take time and connect with me because in that moment God the end time church just isn't kind of staring at the sky we're we're engaged in our communities we're engaged in our cities we're we're engaged because God is going to do a work and, and God's calling us. The Bible, Acts 13, 3.19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. What are we doing? We're preparing our hearts and we're preparing our lives. While we're waiting, then we're examining our lives. We're turning from sin. We're engaged in what God is going to do. We're planning for it. So that, what, why? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. God's refreshing promise is coming. We look in so many places for that refreshing. And it can only come from his presence. The times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The times of refreshing don't come from that afternoon nap. The times of refreshing don't come from that triple hit Iced latte. The times of refreshing don't come from Tim Hortons. The time of refreshing doesn't come. It doesn't, you know, and I, I, I know we're talking about <clears throat> it's vacation season, so we, we, we all love to spend time with our family and step away and spend time with our, our family. But we, but we need to know that, that, that refreshing, true refreshing, comes from the presence of God. So this is the most valuable place you can be when you need refreshing. We can come back to the music tonight. We seek for the temporary pleasure when God is calling us to conversion. And the absence of sin brings a refreshing in the spirit. All of that happens when we wait the right way and we don't wander. That we wait on God part two and we'll finish up this next week but part two is is connecting not competing i was uh, speaking with pastor Wilbur today about the wonderful spirit of camaraderie that he's been experiencing at some of the districts he's speaking at and he said it's I, i could hear it in his voice he's excited because of the connection that people are making and Districts that are pulling together and binding together and working together and district superintendents that are, are at one another's conference. It's just, it's just so exciting to see and hear about that because, because this end time revival happens in an environment where we connect and not compete. We're not in this to compete. Revival doesn't happen when we have a spirit of competition when we all pull together. Joel 2 is about all those people from every generation, demographic, socioeconomic platforms, all all the people from different cultures and races and all those people coming together under one banner called revival. When we are connecting, 
I could just have your attention. I know Kathy's doing a beautiful job. When we are connecting and not competing, we rise on the tide of each other's competence. When we are connecting and not competing, we rise on the tide of each other's competence. You've got abilities that we don't have. You've got talents and skills and giftings and anointing that some of us don't have. But what happens when we join together? Aaron gets on one side and her on the other. And victory comes. Why? Because we work together. You've got skills that we don't have, but revival, when we don't have a spirit of competence, but we have a, a competition, but we have a spirit of connection, we pull together and revival occurs. We will never see revival if we're only looking to see who has the most likes. God can't use us if we're trying to turn revival into competitive sport. Can't do it. Because all of a sudden, we get in the way of what God wants to do. God says, it's not about competition, it's about connection. But what happens when there's genuine connection? Then God uses each one of us in our own way. Like a train that carries unique cargo in each car. Disconnected, it's useless. But when we all pull together, we bring what's needed to the place of delivery. We, we're able to deliver what, what, what each of us has for our world that desperately needs it. That's what happens when God allows his church to come into a spirit of revival. When we acknowledge that God gets to choose who he chooses and we ban the competition, then God can work through individuals and their own abilities. And it's not just people, it's not just people on a platform, whether that's the singing team or it's not just people in our sound tech booth that I literally, I can't, I can get a computer turned on back there. I didn't even have the passwords to log in. So I, I'm lost. I'm, I'm at the mercy of those great people at the back. Genuinely need them. Every one of them. But what, ha what would happen if, if we began to fight one another? And all of a sudden, that if, you know, the sound tech thought that maybe I was just going a little too long tonight. He didn't. I turned me off. But what would happen if we didn't work together? What would happen? And what would happen if it just, it all began to be this silos that grew and Everybody, they're being their own bar graph on a bar chart. That, that, that isn't what God intends for the church. God intends for us to connect. That there's a body of believers that link arm in arm and hand in hand and heart to heart. And we connect. And God uses us. The power of connection. The, the spirit of competition will make you a jealous onlooker on the day of outpouring. Peter received the keys to the kingdom and Peter received the revelation flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you and we preach Acts 2 and if there had been reporters they all would have been looking for hey where's Simon Peter we want to talk to Simon Peter we're going to get the best story if we can, if we can get a hold of Simon Peter but, but don't forget Simon Peter was also the, the guy that walked away in humility when the rooster crowed and God allowed him to walk a very low path but ultimately, here's the key, is that the church was the beneficiary of that apostolic revival because the disciples decided to work together. They waited and they worked together. They were connected. Ban the competition. Someone say connection. It's so much more powerful. In Luke chapter 10, 
God knows what he's doing. He said, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. His disciples were challenged and commissioned. But then he said, he sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would come. There's a powerful key here. The phrase one another, it's derived from the Greek word alelon, which means one another, each other, mutually, reciprocally. It, it occurs over a hundred times in the New Testament. Approximately 59 of these occurrences are specific commands teaching us how and how not to relate to one another. That one another, that, that working together is what prepares the way for God to do the great work of revival. It, it said that, that he sent them to and to before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. The power of our connection with one another, it's unbelievable. And it's paramount importance is there in scripture. A revival church is about relationships and connections and accomplishing the work of the kingdom together. A revival church has people that join arm in arm and they, they go two by two before his face into every city and place and, and then God shows up. Two by two. Do you know, do you know how absent true authentic, genuine relationship is in our world. We've had a generation indoctrinated with the idea of connection and social circles and friends are made with just a single click of a button of someone you may not even know. That's, that's the generation that stands. So the word friend doesn't mean anything to them. So can you imagine what would happen if they come into the kingdom of God and they come into a church and they truly connect with somebody or people and God begins to work together through them. How powerful, how unforgettable that is. He did not send them alone. He, he required them to go with one another. The power of connection. We are planning fresh fire weekend this fall. We're expecting Holy Ghost outpouring. We're expecting revival fires to burn. But in order to get the people here that need the Holy Ghost, someone's got to go. I'm grateful for door hangers and I'm grateful for the pull of the Spirit. And, it, it, you know, I was talking to someone just the other day. I was like, yesterday I think I was talking with someone and I said you know it's remarkable to me that every time that we would do an outreach maybe we couldn't point directly to somebody that we connected with but sure enough on Sunday when the kingdom of God is at work and we come together as a church somebody would be there they may not even have been a, a, a person that we did outreach to but God just said oh I'm going to draw this person here because of the work you did over here and, and it's just like you know we sow the seed but God brings the increase and when we do our part, but God said, here's how you do it. You go two by two. You go one, gather together. We, we all need somebody that we can connect with as a prayer partner, as an accountability partner. We need someone that we can pray with and worship with and intercede with and network together with. We, we all need somebody like that. We need fellowship. And there, there's a reason why we call it Connect Night is so that we can connect. We need to start speaking the promises of God to one another. We need to start building one another up. We need to, to start living out some of those scriptures that God uses in the New Testament about one another. We need one another. We need each other tonight. We need to find someone willing to go into the highways and the byways. We need to find someone wanting a home Bible study. We need, we need to work together. And new believers will cost us They'll cost us time, energy, effort. They'll take a toll in your emotions, but there's nothing like seeing people come into the kingdom of God. So sometimes we have to ask ourselves, we're, we're talking about, you know, the principle of revival. This second principle is about, you know, it, do we, is it comp competition or is it connection? Are we going to, 
compete with one another? Are we going to compete to see what the kingdom of God does through one person or another person? Or are we going to connect and watch what God can do? Because it just happens to be there in scripture that if any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask it and it shall be done for them. That there's power in connection. There's power in us agreement. And the verse goes on. It says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. There's power in connection. There's power in connection. There, there, <clears throat> I wrote this down today. There are no normal new births anymore. I don't even know what a normal new birth would be. But here's what I know in the supernatural realm. Every new spiritual baby is the product of a world that's opposed to new birth. And I understand the need to wean. And I understand that we can't just kind of keep people coddled forever. But here's what else I know is that we can't baptize new babies and push them down Downing Street in a baby buggy all by themselves. Amen. Can stand together with me. Lord, send a revival and let it start in me. Lord, send a revival and let it start in me. And if it'll start in me, if I can just connect with somebody. Lord, set a revival and let it start in me. Would you let that be your prayer? We're getting ready to close, but I wonder if you just pause and let everything that we've just talked about for the last few minutes to settle in your spirit. Come on, if our church really is their church, then we've got to, we've got to make sure they know where we are. And if our church is their church, then we've got to be sure that someone is able to come and find a welcoming face and find someone that's connecting with them. We, we need people that are willing to connect. It's not a competition. It's, it's connection. It's that opportunity that we have to be the kingdom of God, to love one another, to serve one another, to build one another up, to encourage one another. Father, I thank you tonight for your word. I thank you for the challenge. God, I believe this revival that Joel spoke about is going to be evident, obvious, and a part of our end time days. God, don't let us get lost in the waiting for it season. Don't let us get sidetracked. God, I pray that you would give us the ability to connect with one another and see your kingdom come. God, don't let us work independently. Don't let there be any Lone Ranger Christians. Don't let there be anybody just independent and isolated. I pray, God, that you would open our eyes to the someone on the sidelines. I pray that you would open our spirit to the somebody that has yet to connect. I pray, God, help us to open our circle of influence to include the brand new, the, the person that's the new on the block. God, I pray that you would open our hearts. God, lift us into that place of purpose that you have for us. God, help us to see that revival. But God, it doesn't happen independent of us. It happens through us. I give you praise tonight, God, that your anointing rests in this room. God, let those doors be more than a place that we come in to your presence. Let those doors be a place where we, God, commune with a world that needs you. I pray, God, let us be your voice, your hands, your feet, and your light in the midst of darkness, we ask. Would someone just pray in the Holy Ghost for a moment? If that little revival fire is burning in your spirit, it's There's a witness in the Holy Ghost right now. God, help us to understand what we're waiting for. God, help us to see it. Give us a vision. God, give us a vision. 
God, give us a vision. A vision of what revival looks like. A vision, God, of how we're going to be involved. A vision, God, give us that burden today, we pray. In your name. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Would someone just tell your neighbor, our revival needs you. Amen. Those are just two principles. We'll finish next week. God bless you. We love you very much. Dismissed in Jesus' name tonight.